And, um, you know, I, I just really have to trust the early fathers in their delineation and their differentiation between what belonged in the canon of Scripture and what was considered spurious and invalid. And um, so those things which are inconsistent, you know, one of the things that we know is that uh, the Apostle James talked about every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so we know that there is a consistency uh, to the nature and the character of God. You know, if Jesus was cursing people as a child and making them blind and that type of thing, well, it was the polar opposite of what he did as an adult. Um, in, uh, you know, in Luke chapter 9, a couple of Jesus' disciples wanted to call down cursing, call down fire on a Samaritan village and destroy them, and Jesus rebuked them and said, hey, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so uh, I would reject on many grounds what, is, uh, what, what conservative evangelical scholars call pseudepigraphia, which are false writings, which typically were um, coming from Gnostic sources trying to uh, impose a, a, a counterfeit theological agenda. Paul referred to this in 2 Corinthians 11. Not, I know many of these were much later, but he said, if anybody brings to you another gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit. You know, Paul was very aware of, of the false. Uh, John was as well. In 1 John, he said, he said there are many uh, false spirits in the world and judge the, the spirits to see whether they be of God. And then he gave the criteria. So the uh, criteria in the uh, written word of God that we have, the 27 books of the New Testament, to me stand uh, with a clarity and ring with a, a genuineness that these false writings uh, possess. Now, there was another part of your question, and you, you talked about... Um, the uh, some of the scholars say, well, these writings of Tertullian, these writings of Origen, these writings of Augustine, you know, those they were embellishing these things and that type of thing. Well, you know, if if we're going to start down that road, now there is a there is a type of uh, literature that's called hagiography, and that is. Um, writings about saints that were, some were clearly embellished. And in, in my research, to me, it's pretty easy to tell when something is fanciful and, you know, somebody was writing as a part of somebody's fan club to make them appear bigger than life. Uh, versus uh, legitimate writings of early church fathers and, um, and so I, I, I look at, are the types of healings and miracles described biblical? Are they consistent with the biblical accounts? And to me, if they're not consistent with biblical accounts, then I think they are suspect. Um, but, you know, you do run into a, a degree of legitimacy to what you're saying, because by the time of Martin Luther, uh, certainly um, the institutional church, and, and there was a lot of hagiography during that time, where many of the uh, miracles that were documented in the Middle Ages were, I think, are very suspect. Um, for example, uh, people praying to relics, to dead saints, and so on, and then, um, and then the institutional church claiming these miracles validated them as the true church. And of course, Martin Luther uh, came up against that and said no, and that's where they came up with sola scriptura. Uh, we're only going to go with the scripture. And the scripture alone is authoritative. So by the time you get to Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, you do have some of the reformers that, that 
that's where some of the cessationism, especially from Calvin, emerged because they had seen by that time, by the 1500s, they had seen an abuse of of claims regarding healing and the supernatural. And they challenged the church to come back to uh, the, the scriptural foundation and not base anything on external happenings. What's interesting is that uh, even though they were operating in that framework historically, and they were living in a time, you know, Luther talked, uh, one of the early, well, not early father, but one of the uh, reformers made the statement that there were enough splinters from the original cross in Europe to rebuild the Noah's Ark. You know, people were so superstitious and uh, there had grown a lot of abuses by that time. So, um, but Martin Luther himself prayed for some sick people who got healed. Uh, Martin Luther uh, prayed for two of his associates, uh, Philip Melanchthon, uh, who said that Luther's prayers were responsible for him being brought back from the edge of death. And Friedrich Myconius, another colleague of Martin Luther's, also credited Martin Luther's prayers uh, with his physical healing. Um, in 1523, Martin Luther preached a sermon on John 14, 12. And of course, you know, John 14, 12 is where Jesus said, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. It was saying, it was, a, it was a, one of the most uh, often quoted verses by continuationists where Jesus himself said, not simply the apostles, but he that believes on me. See, there, there's always been this tendency to say, well, this is just for the apostles. And Jesus didn't say these things were just for the apostles. He said, he said these signs shall follow them that believe. And um, so anyway, uh, Luther was preaching on John 14, 12. And he said, there are some, and we quote this in my book, he said, there are some who say that this verse is not for today, that these things have, continued, uh, have discontinued. But Luther said, these are the words of Jesus, and, and this is the word of God, so we must let it stand. And so you have, I understand the, the initial, the first generation reformers were so focused on uh, just restoring the biblical truth of justification by faith that they were not looking. And they, and they were aware of so many, what they believed were counterfeit miracles that they did tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But um, the second generation, third generation beyond the Reformation, they began to, um, I, I talked about Wesley by the time you get to him in the 1700s, uh, George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, I think he was 1600s, but I'm not sure. Um, even some of the Anabaptists, um, you know, who were considered the radical reformers beyond Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin. The Anabaptists had certain miracles and gifts of the Spirit uh, in their uh, camp, so to speak. And so it did not take long uh, to get beyond that foundation of justification by faith until the Holy Spirit started building, rebuilding on that foundation to where the church could begin to again step into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. By the time you get to the 1800s, um, you had these miracles and healings under Wesley, which many times are not reported a lot, but they're, they're well documented in Wesley's own journals. Um, and so, but by the time you get to the 1800s, you have a real resurgence of emphasis on divine healing. And you have a lot of that happening in Europe. Uh, 
people like Johann Blumhardt of Germany and Dorothea Trudell of um, Switzerland. They had wonderful healing ministries in the 1800s. And you come across the uh, Atlantic and you have uh, Dr. Charles Cullis, who was a physician in Boston, who, who learned about divine healing from these European ministers. And, um, and then, of course, you go into the 19th and 20th centuries with um, Azusa Street and so on. So there's just a glorious thread uh, and, and really a river of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, we kind of skipped over the, uh, the medieval period, but you, you had people there. Uh, that Peter Waldo of, um, I'm trying to think of the city that he was in. He may have been from Lyon. He was from France. Um, you have Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, you had voices even then. You know, so much darkness and traditionalism and formalism had um, darkened so much of the church, the institutionalism and formalism. But there were always people who were hungry for God and reaching out for God. And whenever they were, uh, God was showing himself strong and God was showing himself powerful. That's an amazing answer. <laughs> um, really detailed. I, it, a couple things come to mind as I'm listening to you. You know, you mentioned uh, how many of these early writings that were kind of anti or trying to do counterfeit miracles like the Gospel yeah. of Thomas. Um, how many of them were Gnostic? And, and yet even, I think you said Ignatius is one of the ones who even spoke of the miraculous. And for those who don't know, Ignatius was one of the earliest of the church fathers that we know of. Mm -hmm. um, 110 to 120 AD, in fact, I think if I remember right. Um, and yet it seems that the enemy was trying as within the first century of the church's existence, trying to eliminate the spirit from church right. functioning and focus everything just on theology so that we all had it in our head, but no real experience of the spirit. Uh, that seems to have been what the enemy has been trying to do all along and is still trying to do. Very much. I, I mean, Satan wants a, a, a church without power. Satan is not afraid of a church that is just all formalistic and ritualistic, but he does not want a church that is equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit. You mentioned Ignatius there, Ignatius of Antioch, and um, he, he and um, Polycarp of Smyrna, were both disciples of John, it is believed. Uh, we know for a fact that Polycarp, and we have strong suspicion that Ignatius of Antioch was as well. And Ignatius wrote a letter to Polycarp. Uh, he, Ignatius wrote a series of letters. And uh, to Polycarp, he told him, he said, he said, linger constantly in prayer he said, ask God for invisible things. Isn't that interesting? Ask God for invisible things that they may be revealed to you and that you may lack no gift of the Spirit. So if the gifts of the Spirit had stopped, if anybody would have known it, it would have been Ignatius and Polycarp because they were there on the continent of Asia Minor. Uh, they were both disciples of John. And so if, um, if the gifts of the Holy Spirit had ceased when the last apostle died, uh, as some people are prone to say, then Ignatius would not have been telling Polycarp to ask God for invisible things so that the gifts of the Spirit would be plentiful in his life. And then Polycarp is the one who sent um, Irenaeus over to France uh, to minister there, kind of to be a bishop in Lyon. And it, uh, Ir Irenaeus had lots of healings and miracles. And he was a disciple of Polycarp. So you do see this continuation. Don, can I read something to the group here, Don? Yeah, do. I want to... I want to read a statement, and because you had said that your um, uh, some professor or someone had uh, some cessationist you were talking with had talked about um, 
that uh, the, the healings only happened around the, you know, transitionary times. Yes. And I want to read to you something and ask everybody if they have any thoughts on who might have said this. Um, and I'm looking in the book, sorry about that, but I'm going to find this statement. Okay, here, here's a statement from someone. And today, when the gospel is proclaimed on the frontiers of the Christian faith that approximate the first century situation, meaning in places where people are hearing the gospel for the first time, miracles, miracles still sometime accompany the advance of the gospel, as indicated by both the prophets Hosea and Joel. As we approach the end of the age, we may expect miracles to increase. Now, that's the first part. The second part is this, same person. I believe we will see a dramatic recurrence of signs and wonders that will demonstrate the power of God to a skeptical world. Just as the powers of Satan are being unleashed with greater intensity, so I believe God will allow signs and wonders to be performed. Okay, so that's a quote from our book. Um, it's, I'm quoting from another book. But anybody want to take a guess on who that statement was that I just read the two portions? Anybody? Tim, do you want to take a guess? Oh, I think your mic is muted. Yeah. Do you want to take a guess who that was? Was it John Wesley or? That was Billy Graham. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was Billy Graham. Now, can I tell you something about uh, Billy Graham and Oral Roberts? Yes. Billy Graham was good friends with Oral. And a lot of people don't know that when Oral, um, when, when it was the dedication of Oral Roberts University, the, the campus in, I think it was 1966, a lot of people don't know that the dedication speaker was Oral Roberts. Oh, Oral did the that. dedication. And uh, Oral had exposure, I'm sorry, Billy Graham had exposure to certain Pentecostal things. Um, and, and we understand Billy Graham, I'm not claiming that Billy Graham was a Pentecostal or a charismatic, you know, he was Baptist in his background, very evangelical, very focused on souls. Um, but I believe it was, and, and we document this in the book too, I have, I have uh, written documentation from the gentleman who was the president of, um, was it assembly? I think it was the Assembly of God Theological Seminary. And he wrote me this personally, um, that in, I think it was 1983, that the Assemblies of God in Springfield, Missouri, had Oral, uh, Billy Graham, I keep talking about Oral, sorry. They had Billy Graham to speak to the students at the Assembly of God Theological Seminary and Central Bible College and Evangel, whatever all the schools are there in Springfield. And Billy Graham got up and gave a, a sermon, a message, and he, he, he actually, um, he didn't get his whole sermon completed. And um, so he said, well, I, I could say more, but I've kind of taken up my time. And so he closed his message. And as he dismissed himself from the pulpit, one of the students in the balcony gives a tongue, you know, just, a, you know, out loud. And um, as Billy Graham is stepping away from the pulpit. And uh, so the president, actually at that time it was, um, I want to say it was Zimmerman, who was the head of the entire Assembly of God. He's the general superintendent. He waited for the tongue to be finished, and then there was an interpretation of the tongue. Mm 
And uh, so he goes ahead and dismisses the meeting. But he doesn't know how is Billy Graham going to handle a tongue and interpretation. And so um, they go back to the speaker's room and he asked Billy Graham what he thought. And Billy Graham said, well, he says, I've got to say, I'm quite impressed. He said the message that just came out through that tongue and interpretation was the last part of my sermon that I did not finish. And he showed him the notes. And so the Holy Spirit, through tongues and interpretation, finished Billy Graham's sermon uh, at that particular event. And Billy Graham talked about that on national Christian television a week later and talked about how refreshing and inspiring it was. Well, I was sharing this information with a, a nationally known minister. Everybody would know the name if I used it. Um, but he told me that Oral Roberts told him personally that he visited Billy Graham many times at Billy Graham's house, home in North Carolina, and that I think it was the very first visit that, that I guess there were a handful of ministers there, and Billy Graham said, would you all pray for me? And uh, so these ministers, you know, kind of stood around Billy Graham and prayed for him, and uh, when it was Oral's turn to pray, Oral prayed in other tongues, you know, prayed in the spirit over Billy Graham. And afterwards, uh, Billy Graham told Oral, Oral, uh, that really blessed me. Nobody's ever prayed for me in other tongues. Thank you. And Oral said that every time that he got together with Billy Graham after that, that Billy Graham would always say, Oral, pray for me in other tongues. And it was something that really blessed Billy Graham. And so um, we, we have a chapter, the chapter that I was reading from where I quoted Billy Graham, we have a chapter called The 20th Century Explosion, where we start with Azusa Street. And a lot of people don't know that when Azusa Street happened in Los Angeles, that there were other outpourings in other nations that were very similar to Azusa Street. Uh, one of those was in India. India had something real similar to Azusa Street. And what a lot of people don't know is that Korea had that. And, and one of the major places it happened in Korea was in Pyongyang. Now that was before Korea was divided into North and South. And of course, you know, with the communism and that type of thing, um, you know, the, the, the movement of the church was brutally crushed and repressed in the North. But in 1907, Pyongyang, North Korea had a great outpouring of the spirit. And of course, there were, there were elements in South Korea as well. And of course, South Korea today is sending out almost as many missionaries as the United States, if not more. So there's still a residual effect from the Korean outpouring in the early 1900s. Uh, a bit of that happened in Pyongyang, where Kim Jong-un is, you know, the uh, leader there. And so, uh, but in, the, in this chapter on the 20th century explosion, we go through Azusa Street, we go through the healing revival. Of course, um, I had the privilege of, of working with uh, Kenneth Hagen for 18 and a half years and traveling with him. So I include some things on Brother Hagen. But then in the next chapter after that, uh, we go into... Uh, a chapter called Expansion, Recognition, and Integration. And we talk about how the move of the Spirit, and, and a lot of this happened through the uh, charismatic movement, um, much of the early outpourings of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, kind of channeled into Pentecostal denominations. And of course, Full Gospel Businessmen's was very instrumental in this 
uh, transdenominational uh, uh, movement of the Holy Spirit because it got outside the walls of the Pentecostal denominations and it brought the influence of the Holy Spirit to people from every kind of imaginable background, whatever denomination they were or of no denomination whatsoever. So we go into that as well in that chapter. And um, uh, so anyway, uh, God's been doing some amazing things. And, um, you know, in the United States, sometimes as Pentecostal spirit-filled people, we may feel like, well, maybe we're not quite in the majority, but the growth of the Pentecostal charismatic spirit-filled experience is, is just growing exponentially. And in other nations outside of the United States, uh, really, it's the non-Pentecostals in many cases that are the minority. Uh, the people who believe in the gifts of the Spirit, the people who pray for the sick, in many other nations, they're not in the minority, they're in the majority. So good things have happened, are happening, and good days are ahead. I know your bio says that your, your assignment is strengthening churches and pastors or leadership. Um, yes. Can you share a little bit about some of your experience and things that are going on there? And, um... Yes, happy to. Um, one of the things I did when I was on staff at Rama in 1985, um, of course, Rama started as a Bible school in the fall of 1974. And Rama grew very exponentially. You know, sometimes it was doubling every year. And at that time, there really, I don't think there was, there were a whole lot of options for people. Um, I know Christ for the Nations, of course, founded under Gordon Lindsay. And we talk about Gordon a lot. I, I've always admired Gordon Lindsay. Um, but, but Rama and Christ for the Nations were two major pillars of tr biblical and ministerial training. And so I personally attended Rama as a student starting in the fall of 79, finished the two-year program in the spring of 81. And then in the fall of 83, I came on staff as a teacher. And um, in uh, the spring of 85, uh, Rama started a ministerial association to license and ordain folks. And uh, I became the national director of that, working under the Hagans. And um, in just a few years, we had grown to 2,400 licensed and ordained ministers. And um, so every day, I did that for 13 and a half years. Um, I traveled with Brother Hagan from about 89 through 93, uh, five or six weeks a year when he would do ministers conferences in different parts of the country. So directing the ministerial association, um, not exaggerating this, I, I was on the phone every day with pastors, uh, counseling, praying with, helping them through challenges. Uh, several times the Hagans would put me on a plane to go help a church that was in distress. Um, you know, I oversaw that organization with the 2,400 licensed and ordained ministers. So it just something that grew in me to uh, minister to and relate to and encourage people in leadership uh, in the body of Christ. And um, when I stepped away from Rama in 2002, and I still have a wonderful relationship, that's still my church home, and, you know, um, very appreciative of Rama. Um, but uh, we began traveling, and I began writing books, and many of the books we have written deal with, for example, my second book is called In Search of Timothy. And it deals with the, the relationship between senior leaders and assistant leaders, like Paul and Timothy. And that book is in about eight or nine different languages right now. Um, and I, I wrote a book called Qualified Serving God with Integrity and Finishing Your Course with Honor. So a lot of the teaching and training that we do in churches and ministers' conferences uh, deals with church leadership. I just wrote a book um, 
this is actually a mock-up copy because it's being printed right now and it will be available in about three weeks, but it's called Relationships Matter, uh, Lessons from Paul and the People Who Impacted His Life. And I talk in that book about, I wrote that during the initial phase of this shutdown, the coronavirus shutdown. Um, I, I talked about how Paul had to relate to all different kinds of people. You know, he had people like Timothy who were very loyal to him, but then he had people like Demas who abandoned him and people like Mark who didn't work out at the beginning, but worked out later. And then Alexander the coppersmith who did him much harm. You know, we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, ministry more than anything else is people business. You know, it's not just preaching sermons, but you got to work with people. And so all of this has kind of come out of, you know, decades here of working with pastors, helping them sharpen their skills, helping them work through the issues and the challenges of leadership. You know, even during this uh, coronavirus situation, I've been in communication, not every day, uh, but probably three or four times a week, I'm sending emails to a, a, a group of pastors and we're doing idea exchanges and things like that. And we're just, um, you know, not claiming to have all the answers, but we're getting our heads together and um, sharing ideas with each other, what's working, you know, what are good attitudes, approaches, strategies, et cetera. So it just seems like that's something God put on my heart early on was to help. I, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I don't have any official organization. Uh, I'm not competing with anybody that does license or ordain, really just trying to be a friend to spiritual leaders. Uh, we have a website with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles for leaders. And um, so we, we really just try to be a resourcing um, place uh, for leaders to get helpful resources. That's what it boils down to. Yeah, this is, this is really relevant, I think, because you know, we're only a couple of days away from Pentecost. Right. I think it's Sunday. And... Mm -hmm. And people not familiar with a lot of the Jewish background, they don't realize that on Pentecost, uh, unlike all the other festivals and the other sacrifices, they actually did an offering that involved leavened bread instead mm -hmm. of just unleavened. And the rabbi said that that was to represent reaching out to the Gentiles. Isn't that something? And it is interesting to me yeah. that the outpouring of the Spirit that's really the beginning of the church is the day that's associated with the light of, of Judaism reaching out to the Gentiles through Messiah. Uh, so I think that's really relevant that we're coming up on that season. So the things you're sharing are really, really important. Yeah. Um, I don't know time-wise how this looks, Tim. Do we have time for a few people to ask questions? Or do yes, you know? we can do that. Okay. Anybody have things they want to ask Tony? I do. I've got a Hi, I've got a couple of questions, Tony. Thank you for this. This is really, really good. You know, I, I had 60 hours of seminary at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and one of my favorite courses there was uh, church history. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of your stuff, you know, you're talking about, we had that before. But I got, I got a couple of questions. So um, you talked about Azusa Street, and, and, you know, what came out of that was, um, I think, Pentecostalism, Assemblies of God denomination and all that. Was there any kind of set denomination that was charismatic before Azusa Street started? The closest thing I could think of was maybe the Quakers, but I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know of any. Yeah. Nothing that had the, the magnitude and the uh, traction. You did have a group in the mid and I forgive my dates aren't exact, but I, I want to say it was the mid 1800s uh, called the Irvingites in um, Edward Irving was based in London and they had a pretty clear uh, experience base and they had some doctrine about the tongues was an evidence of the infilling and uh, that type of thing, but the Irvingites didn't really get the kind of traction and have the big multiplication 
that followed Azusa. So I think, yeah, there were definitely some um, uh, preliminary movements before Azusa. Uh, you mentioned the Quakers, and we have a, a section on George Fox in my book, uh, who is the founder of the Quakers. And George Fox had, again, all kinds of healings and miracles that happened. Um, one of his uh, fellow evangelists, a gentleman by the name of, I want to say Edward Burroughs, talked about some of their meetings, and he uses the phrase that people were speaking with other tongues. Mm -hmm. um, the Quakers m kind of shifted into um, an element that, that theologians call quietism. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of, I think it was Wesley that said, you know, that kind of killed their movement. Um, uh, because the, the thing was just, let's be quiet and wait on God and don't say anything. And, you know, um, but, but in its early days and, and Hey, there have been a lot of movements that started with an explosion and then went dead, you know, uh, yeah. went quiet well, on the it. reason they were called Quakers is because the, the spirit of God would come upon them and they would start to shake. Mm -hmm. You very much, yeah, and they had that, and um, uh, George uh, Fox talks about that in his writings, and um, and we, I'm trying to think which chapter that is in. Let me just look real quick. And and by the way, my book is dedicated to one of my church history professors, uh, who was a Quaker before he got spirit filled, and his uh -huh. name is Cooper Beatty. If anybody here went to Rama. Uh, Cooper taught church history forever at uh, Rama, and um, I'm trying to think. I think it's in a chapter called "Faith Gets Personal and Powerful," uh, where I talk about Zinzendorf, the founder of the Moravians, yeah. and I think that's where uh, George Fox is also in that chapter because the reformation was kind of an intellectual movement mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of emphasis on the heartfelt experiential side of things mm -hmm. and so it was some other people who came along uh philip spinner um zinzendorf and fox who who really said, hey, the doctrine of justification by faith is good, but we need more than an intellectual theological concept. We need heartfelt, personal, meaningful experience with God. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was what impacted the Moravians, and the Moravians impacted Wesley. Mm -hmm. And then you also have out of that uh, George Fox. Um, who who was part of that, uh, I think we deal with all of them in that particular chapter. Yeah, well, the Moravians started that 24 hours a day prayer movement that uh, I think is mm -hmm. still going on, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I've, heard, I've read of it lasting 100 years, but they've probably rekindled it and probably still have it going. But that launched uh, modern missions. The Reformers... They, the reformers got certain things right and certain things wrong. They got justification by faith right. But some of the reformers who said that the day of miracles has passed, they also did not believe in evangelism because mm. of that hyper-Calvinistic view. Um, some of the reformers taught that, you know, world missions, that was kind of for the first century. And, um, and, and some of the reformers did not have much missionary concept at all. They thought, we're just really here to reform the church. Uh, it wasn't until the Moravians came along, and then, and then William Carey and the modern missions movement, where they said, hey, reformers, you know, your theology on justification by faith is great, but the Great Commission is still for today. You know, we think of people being cessationists in saying that the, the day of miracles is not for today. But boy, there were people all through 
the early days of the Reformation that thought evangelism and missions had passed away also. They were wrong on that. Yeah. Terribly wrong. What do you think about Thomas Doughty? I mean, um, or I, that was his first name, I think. But Doughty was that guy in the late 1800s that was that faith healer. Yeah. He called himself the, the new Elijah and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, Alexander Dowie. Um, That's it, right. He founded a group called um, Zion in Illinois. And I'll tell you, a lot of the uh, really famous people of the 20th century came out of Zion. F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth, uh, Gordon Lindsay. Um, boy, there was another one. John G. Lake had exposure to Zion. Um there's another one or two that are very famous that I'm missing. Dowie, Dowie, he, he had a real faith for healing and miracles, but his doctrine got really weird. Um, and he kind of went off track. Well, so you Branham a little bit, I think. Branham, they had, the, Branham and Dowie did the exact same thing. Uh, they both got, I, I call, you know, getting it into pride or whatever, but they actually both began believing that they were Elijah. Um, I've been to Branham's grave in Southern Indiana and uh, boy, it's weird. Uh, Branham got to believing that he was, you know, he was the John the Baptist for the second coming of Christ. Um, he believed he was the Elijah to come. So both of those men were mightily used of God, but both of them got, in my opinion, very, very deceived. And they ended up kind of with a real mixed legacy. And that's why I don't focus on much of them either one of them in my book very much. I, I probably mentioned them, but I, I would rather focus on the people who stayed on track, who kept their doctrine solid. Um, they did a lot of good, but they also brought a lot of damage, in my opinion. Okay. That brings up a point, too. And uh, um, well, Go ahead. I'll, I'll let you ask a question. I'll, I can bring this up later. Um, I've got two questions, um, like the uh, DC press reporters. Um, the first question is, what do you think of the lost book of Acts? And then the second one is, what do you think of the book of Enoch? Oh, that's good. I was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not super knowledgeable about them. Um, I know that some of the books will have certain information that has some level of value to it. Um, but I would, I will be really honest with you. There are people who have studied that and know it way better than I do. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of have to defer. Um, you know, I, I believe there are reasons specifically. I put a lot of faith in, um, people like Athanasius and the early church leaders who decided that those books did not belong in the canon. And it's not that there's not some historical value in some of them, but honestly, I'm, I'm uh, unqualified to give you a super educated answer on that. So I'm curious with the Enoch. book of Enoch that um, I've seen it in the Geneva Bible and I wondered yeah. how big of a deal it was at the Council of Nicaea. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that. I think Jude didn't, Jude and Peter quote from it. Yes. yes. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know that it played a major role in the Council of Nicaea. Uh, it could have. I, I, I don't know. The, uh, some of the early church fathers, and I think Athanasius, Athanasius I can't even say his name now, was one, and one or two others, Cyril maybe, they referred to some of those other books, and, and they specifically said they are not scripture, but they're useful for Christians to read. Right. Mm -hmm. So they, they made a distinction until pretty close to the Middle Ages. Um, so they said they were worth reading, but they said they don't have the same level of, of validity as scripture would. Yeah, and there were other books, Shepherd of Hermas, and I'm trying to think of some of the Didache and different ones that definitely had value, um, you know, 
and then you know so you have to kind of work between the apocryphal and and then books that were were just um uh plants you know from the gnostic sources that were trying to um and and actually some of those books probably did have play a role in the council of nicaea because they were dealing with uh arianism which which stripped uh the divinity tried to undermine the divinity of Christ mm. and certain Gnostic sources would have certainly contributed to that. So mm. yeah, probably did have a role to play. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it's some of what you bring up, uh, th this has been something I've run into in the seminary setting is um, trying to put theology itself in the proper perspective. Because I, I my whole life I've tended to kind of think of theologians as people who take simple things and make them so complicated that we need them to explain them to us. But in reality, um, even as uh, J. Gresham Machen said, he's a pastor from around 1900, uh, and, and his book on liberalism and Christianity, he specifically says that all theology starts with experience. And so it seems to me then that you know, and in Pentecostal movements, we tend to discount theology a little too much. Yeah. Probably because we don't understand what its purpose is. And we start with the experience with God through the Holy Spirit. We have an encounter with God. Theology helps us understand the experience in a way that it keeps us from going off track. Like some mm -hmm. of the people you mentioned, like uh, Brandon. And, mm -hmm. um, and so theology plays a really important role, but it's certainly not a substitute for the work of the Spirit in us. We have to have that first, and then theology helps us keep that in balance so that we don't do something crazy and go off the rails. Helps right. us understand what God's trying to do with us. Mm -hmm. And that provides a, a, a situ an environment in which we can grow properly the way God wants us to. So, Very much. It's good. So I would That's throw that in. Truth is not taught. Truth is learned. Very good. Truth is learned. Yes. And the Bible talks about people who are ever learning and never able to come to the truth. So, you have any other questions? Anybody have a? I wanted to ask uh, Tony, what do you think about the uh, the layman, like our full gospel businessman group? What what part do you see us playing in these last days revival? Probably the most important part. <laughs> um, if you have, trying to think, let me, let me grab one of my books here. I've got, I have a book called Your Place on God's Dream Team, and I'm trying to think where I have it, but I have five quotes, and I'm not going to be able to lay my hands on it immediately, but um, Different. I have five quotes from individuals. Tim, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll find them and email them to you, and then you can pass them around. But I have five quotes from great spiritual leaders who said that laymen will be the most important part of the end time revival, including George Washington Carver, you know, the guy who found all the ways to use the peanut. People don't know that he was a deep and profound man of prayer. And um, I'm trying to think who the others are, but they're, they're well-known ministers to all basically prophesied the same thing, that um, God's greatest instrument in the last days would be the layman. And I believe that. Praise God. Thank you. I'll send you that, Tim, and you can pass that on to everybody if you want. Amen. Tim knows who that is because he's from Tuskegee, Alabama. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Well, George Washington Carver was born uh, just south of Joplin, Missouri, and I've, he was born a slave, and I've been to his homestead. It, it doesn't even exist anymore, but the, where it was, and they have a kind of a national park there, and the story of George Washington Carver, of course, he ended up at Tuskegee with Booker T. Washington, um, but um, the way that man was a man of prayer and he was a man of the spirit. And if you watch some of the secular things on him, they totally stripped that part away. Uh, but he prayed and he believed that God revealed to him the different discoveries that he made, inventions, etc. And uh, he had a phenomenal, I call it a prophecy, mm 
about the role of believers in, in God's last day revival. Yeah, I remember Jack Hayford saying when I was in school, it was back in 1972, <laughs> uh, saying God has no layman. Everyone's a minister. That's just the bottom yeah. line. And then yeah. go into Ephesians 4, talking about how like pastors, apostles, evangelists, pastors, prophets, teachers, uh, which I just did out of order, but uh, they're given to the church for, uh, the word is katertizo, and it's a word that King James translated it perfecting, but it's it's not really the same. It's not the same word that's translated that elsewhere, which has to do with bringing to completion. This word is actually a medical term, refers to setting a broken bone or replacing a disjointed socket. It has a general idea of putting things in order, arranging them in the right place. So the job of ministry, those of us who are in ministry, our job is actually to help people find their place so that they can do the work of the ministry, which will build up the body of Christ. That's what Ephesians says. There's yeah. no such thing as a layman. And if you think of yourself as a layman, you've missed the point of the, the whole yeah. scripture. Yeah. Uh, you are they a think, minister, period. They think layman equals spectator or yeah. observer. And that is as unbiblical as you can get. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Hey, I wanted to recognize, I see uh, my pastor, Dave Kramer, is on. Are you, are you listening, Dave? Hey, Brother Tim. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Please, Tony. I apologize. Yeah. I got the best connection, but uh, I'm so thankful for your ministry and uh, just your wealth of knowledge. But to me, most importantly, your amazing heart to serve other ministers. We love you so much. David, it's good to hear your voice. And for everybody that doesn't know, you guys know David as a great pastor there in, uh, is it Chandler, David? Yes, sir. Yeah. And Chandler, but before David was pastor, you ran the bookstore at Rama, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he ran the bookstore at Rama and uh, was a great blessing at Rama. He was always just a joy and a delight. And uh, we are not a bit surprised that David's doing an outstanding job there in Chandler. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Cook. And also, we were talking about this day with my wife. We, um, he, you had the, we had the privilege of uh, you uh, marrying us. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Special place in our heart, Brother Cook. Always, hey, always, we, always. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, Brother Tony, I have two questions. Um, one is outside what we're talking. One is uh, concerning the what you're sharing here. Uh, the first question is, um, uh, who, what what is, where, uh, what's the source of this skepticism about the supernatural and miracle in the Christendom today? Why is this um, idea that that cannot be possible? What is the source of it? And the, the second, source of kind of cessationism? Yes, that, that there is no supernatural and that miracle are uh, not taking place, or even some went to the extent of saying that okay. uh, the era of apostles have gone. Okay. I, I, you know, boy, we could spend a let, lot let me of time ask on one the question picture. so that you can uh, handle the two together. The second okay. question is, what is your take on the teaching that is going on that uh, when, once, once you're safe, you're safe, that you cannot um, uh, 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 fall out or lose your salvation yeah well i'm gonna let david kramer answer the once saved always saved <laughs> I, just, I just feel like he would have the best insight on that um I'm, I'm kidding um let me let me tackle your first question uh where did cessationism come from uh we could probably spend hours and hours exploring that and researching that, but I think basically to kind of give a, a quick summary answer to that, the more the church fell into formalism and ritualism, the more the supernatural diminished. A major moment of that happening in church history, uh, not, that, not that it ever entirely ceased, but as different groups got away from looking for that, expecting that, believing in that, the more churches got into formalism and ritualism and intellectualism, 
you saw a diminishing of, of supernatural expressions. A major part of that happened in, between the reign of Constantine and the reign of, I want to say it was Theodosius in the fourth century when Constantine uh, passed the Edict of Toleration and then Theodosius made Christianity in the year 380 the official religion of the Roman Empire. And um, the church was no longer persecuted. As a matter of fact, uh, the church received favored status. And to not be a Christian, you could experience uh, persecution or disadvantage is probably is more the proper term. And so the church got flooded with people who were not born again. They brought into the church uh, all of their pagan, the you know, thinking, philosophies, um, you know, just, and, and there was a major move away from the supernatural at that point. There were always groups that contended for the supernatural and the biblical. Uh, but you also had a problem as the church, certain elements of the church moved into more superstition and things of that nature. Um, when you had the, um, similar to the time of the Protestant Reformation, you had the Renaissance, and you had the elevation of intellectualism and reason, and all, anything supernatural was subjugated to being uh, antiquated and uh, obsolete and that type of thing. So all of the effect of, you know, uh, French Renaissance thinking, and uh, there's some other terms that I'm not grabbing in my mind right now, uh, but that brought, um, you know, it made Christianity almost purely an intellectual proposition as opposed to a supernatural proposition. Um, you know, on the issue of um, once saved, always saved, um, wow, we could talk forever about that. And, and there might be, you know, if, if there's 50 people or 20 people watching tonight, there might be 20 or 50 different opinions on it. Um, I tend to kind of go along with what I was taught by Brother Hagen that we are secure in Christ. Um, but I do see in Scripture a few places where it appears that some of the warnings of Scripture uh, are very warranted. Um, and, and boy, these are finally, you know, heavily debated among really good people. There's some really good Calvinists. There's some really good Arminians. Um, I'm, I was raised Presbyterian, so I was raised in a Reformation type thing. Uh, I don't believe it's, you know, that people lose their salvation every time they sin or that type of thing. I do think there are a few cases in Scripture where you see people, you know, for example, Paul turned the person over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, that their spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Um, I, I think probably there's a realm where people can uh, renounce and, and apostatize in that regard. I don't think it's common. And uh, Brother Hagen just said it this way. He said, I think we should preach security enough that people feel secure in Christ, but we should preach against sin strongly enough that people are not inclined to sin. And um, so uh, that's maybe not answering it real directly, but that's a thought. That's good. Um, the, to kind of answer Richard's question a little bit, I can talk from a Southern Baptist perspective. You know, there's that verse of scripture that says, when I was young, I thought as a child and I spoke as a child, but uh, when I became a man, I did away with childish things because you know, I was mature. And the correlation is made there is that when the scripture was canonized and we got the Bible as we have it today, that's when things were completed and now the need for miracles was no longer there. That's the yeah. way that taught and that's where they sit down on the cessationism. Now that's a, that's a misinterpretation of scripture. Yeah. And, and you can, you know, you can throw that one out, but that's, that's the way they see it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and really, you know, when I studied, uh, you know, we were presented with a book um, 
theology book that was presented by a cessationist. And I was prepared for these huge arguments. And I was shocked at how feeble the arguments were biblically for yes. cessationism really feeble One and of the uh, scriptures. yeah like somebody said nobody would ever pick up the new testament read it and from the new testament come to the conclusion that miracles had ceased you, you wouldn't get that from the new testament you have to be taught that by somebody else so do you think tony that comes a lot from just the idea that it's hard for us to imagine anything beyond what we've actually experienced ourselves yeah, I grow up I, in a church that so. doesn't have the miraculous. I'm going to tend to not even think that anything beyond what I've experienced is possible. Yeah, that that's, pretty much how I, that's pretty much how I grew up. I just, you know, nobody ever talked about me. If, if in our church, if they'd pray for somebody in the hospital, it would be, well, Lord, Mary's in the hospital. We ask you to be with her. You know, there's never any expectation of anything supernatural, miraculous, that type of thing. And, and, and so, doctor's wisdom. Yeah, That's sure. <laughs> and those are nice things, but, um, you know, I just assumed, well, if, if, if these things still happened, I'd be hearing about them, and I never heard about them, so I assumed they didn't happen. It was all assumption. Yeah, exactly. And yet, once you've experienced them, it's just kind of hard to go back, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how late yeah. did we go, Tim? Is, is there a time limit on? I hope there's no limit, but uh, we can, uh, <laughs> if people, you know, have any serious questions, we can take them. Uh, otherwise, we can. Yeah, know, I, just, uh, uh, I don't want to go too long, but um, if, you know, if people have questions, I want to give them time to do that. Can I let people know how to get our book? Please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our book, this is the one we've been talking from tonight, Miracles in the Supernatural Throughout Church History. You can get it from our website. And um, we also have tons of free resources on the website. So if you don't want to get the book, you can still get all the free stuff. Um, but my website is simply, it's based on my name, Tony, T-O-N-Y, cook c-o-o-k-e -E. there's an e on the end of cook and it's dot org o-r-g and uh, so anybody that wants to grab that you know you can do that and uh, we just today is the second day that i've held one of these in my hand uh, they just arrived from the printer yesterday and um we had hundreds of pre-orders that we sent out and have been sending out uh, today. Uh, I don't know if they got them all out or not, but um, so this book is literally hot off the press. I mean, it's, it's brand new. Wow. That's, that's exciting. Anybody have any other questions or, uh, you know, we, we appreciate Tony, you taking time. Uh, I know you're writing books, you're doing research and you're helping pastors. And I'm sure there's there's a lot of uh, situations now that we're in lockdown and the churches, a lot of people haven't been given their tithes or hadn't had the money to give tithes. So, I mean, uh, you know, we need to pray for our pastors and our churches yes. and mm -hmm. encourage them. And, and uh, we appreciate you and your ministry. And, and um, Don, why don't you pray uh, for, uh, for Tony and his ministry and, okay. and, uh, and seal this with a, uh, a good prayer for us. Sure, be glad to. Okay. Our Heavenly Father, we just, first of all, we thank you that you never quit doing miracles because we all need them. <laughs> and uh, it's so good to know that you never stopped and to be able to hear that and to take, just to have that much more confidence and strengthen our faith by knowing that for two millennia and more, you have been a miracle working God. And so, Lord, for for everyone listening right now, where there is sickness, we command healing. Where there is depression, we command joy. Where there's financial problems, we command your provision because we know that you are a miracle working God. And Lord, we thank you for the, the ministry that Tony and his wife are doing and we just pray your blessing on them. That doors will open, that you will work powerfully through them, that we will see leadership become emboldened to step forth and speak the word in a way that we see the miraculous happen all across this country. And especially now when there's so many things going on and, and 
The lockdown has caused so many problems for so many people. We especially ask that your spirit would work through the church leadership uh, where they are, and that you would use Tony as a means of, of empowering and encouraging those who need that. So Lord, we just pray a special blessing on him, that he would do well, that he would be prosperous himself, and that you would protect his health and go before him and just lead the way now. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I saw one of our friends from China just just came on. So uh, uh, anyhow, we you know the, it, it isn't it amazing how Zoom brings people in from all over the world, and we're not you know limited by our territories, and we uh, it's just uh, amazing. I was uh, I just wanted to mention last week we had uh, Michael Van Vlamen, and he said he said I had my schedule. And he said, I was flying around all over the world, but this coronavirus thing just wiped it clean. So now he's, he's got time to, to do Zoom meetings. So in, in one way, it, it hurts. In the other way, it opens doors. So we're excited about that. All right, everybody, we appreciate your uh, coming to our chapter meeting and, you know, look forward to... Uh, Seeing you again next week. So thank you, Tony, so much for your ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was great. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Yes. See you later, buddy. God bless you guys. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bless you. Bless you. Bye-bye, Dave. Bye-bye. Bye.